Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to tonight's Planning and Development Control Committee meeting. My name is Councillor Ahmed Miri. I am chair of the committee. Uh, just to clarify, this is a continuation of the meeting that was held on the 5th of December. That was adjourned. And I've asked officers to do a summary of the reports and presentations that they did from the first meeting. So they will be given an opportunity to um, you know, carry out their reports again. And the speakers will also be given an opportunity to address the committee again tonight. Uh, once again, I'd like to remind all participants of a few housekeeping points before we begin. There is no fire alarm planned for tonight. If the alarm sounds, please wait for security to confirm. They will escort you out of the building. The public fire exit is back in the lift lobby and down the stairs, and toilets can also be found in the lift lobby. Uh, now we move on to item one, which is apologies for absence. As this is a, this is a continuation of the 5th of December meeting, um, and councillors Shabot Verde and Pascu Tabure provided their apologies to that meeting, they were advised not to attend tonight. Apologies have also been received from Councillor Nikos Suslus, if that could be noted. We move on to item two, which is declarations of interest. Do members have any declarations of interest? No, none noted. Okay. And now we move on to item three, which is Shepherd's Bush Market. Um, and once again, as this is a continuation of the 5th of December meeting, I'll ask officers to provide just a summary of their presentations. So can I please invite John Sanchez to uh, provide his report? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on the 5th of December, I ran through the officer's presentation for this planning application in relation to the redevelopment of the Shepherd's Bush Market site, the former old laundry uh, yard, and uh, together with associated access from Goldhawk Road and Uxbridge Road and Pennard Road. Um, the officers uh, were aided by Ian Diaz, the Daylight Sunlight Consultant, appointed by the council, and uh, Ian is here tonight if you've got any, any further questions. As this is a resume meeting, I will draw members' attention to the addendum that was presented at the committee on the 5th of December, which included amendments to the wording of some of the conditions uh, proposed alongside um, um, some changes to the heads of terms, which would form part of the Section 106 agreement. Um, this addendum has been uh, reproduced for the purposes of this reconvened meeting. Um, I summarised the proposals at the last meeting um, and um, basically uh, explaining the surrounding context and conditions of the site. Um, I indicated that the site I indicated that the site is located in the White City Opportunity Area, which covers the same area as the Council's White City Regeneration Area, and also within the Shepherds, uh, Shepherds Bush Metropolitan Town Centre. I also highlighted that the site is located within uh, one of the boroughs identified strategic sites, which is WCRA3 which relates to Shepherd's Bush Market and the adjoining land. I also stated that the, with the exception of 15 Pennard Road, which forms an access point to the development, the site is not located in a conservation area, nor are there any buildings which are listed. The site, however, adjoins the Shepherd's Bush Conservation Area, which covers Pennard Road and is close to a number of other conservation areas. Finally, I also pointed out that the site is in a highly accessible location with a P-Tower level, uh, P level of 6A, indicating excellent level of accessibility. The planning application is accompanied by an environmental impact assessment, which has been considered alongside other supporting documents and plans. I also summarised during the course of the last presentation that the planning application, which is um, which is um, publicised in this committee report, received close to 250 representations, including 126 individual objections, mostly from residents. The objections, alongside all the representations, 
received prior to the publication of the agenda for the meeting on the 5th of December are summarised in section four of the committee report. During the course of the presentation, I also summarised some late representations received. And since officers have been copied into a number of representations which have been sent to members of the committee ahead of the meeting tonight. The objections received and summarised in the officer's report relate primarily to matters of design, height, massing and scale of the development, and, and in particular to the commercial building proposed, considered to be visually dominant and harmful to the character of the Shepherd's Bush Conservation Area by reason of its siting, its size and form, which would adversely impact on residential amenity, including loss of daylight, sunlight, outlook and privacy. And in terms of the existing market and conditions for the existing market traders, comments have been received relating to the existing and proposed leases, rent levels, service charges, together with issues relating to low provision of housing and affordable housing on the site and highway matters, including delivery and servicing and impacts from on-street parking. Objections have been received from the Greenside Residents Action Group, also acting for residents in Pennard Road, Save Shepherds Bush Market, West London Resistance Collective, and residents in surrounding streets, including Lime Grove, Pennard Road, Goldhawk Road, and Scotts Road. 103 letters have been received in support of the proposal, almost 50% from market traders, together with letters of support from the Shepherds Bush Traders Association, West London Chambers of Commerce and Imperial College London. In addition, I highlighted that representations were received um, from a number of statutory bodies, including the Mayor of London, Transport for London, Historic England and the amenity group Hammersmith Society. As highlighted, this is a continuation of the, the adjourned meeting of the 5th of December, and I wish to pick up on some of the points highlighted by the speaker about the officer's report. As reported in, in the report, representations have been received arguing that the proposal will put existing traders' livelihoods at risk and thus undermine the functioning of the market. These representations have been referred to it, uh, have re also referred to the earlier compulsory purchase order, which is referred to in the officer report in paragraph 2.8. For completeness, officers wish to state that following an inquiry, an inspector recommended that the CPO not be confirmed, but the Secretary of State disagreed and confirmed the CPO. However, the Court of Appeal found that that decision was unlawful. That was because in disagreeing with the inspector's view, that guarantees and safeguards for existing traders were inadequate, the Secretary of State had not explained the reasons for his disagreement. The safeguards for existing traders in the CPO scheme were, are materially different from those which are now proposed by the applicant in this application and which are secured through the Section 106 agreement. The CPO inspector found that the traders could not plan for their future because storeholders did not know about the size, form and positioning of replacement stalls and the sizes of retail units were unknown. As, ex as explained in the officer's report, there has been extensive engagement with the traders during the course of the current proposals. The freeholder shops on the eastern side of the market would be retained, while other shops on the eastern side, sorry, on the on the western side would be temporarily relocated, demolished, and reprovided at ground floor level within the commercial building. Some traders will need to, to move temporarily during the development to enable construction works to take place. These traders affected would return as close to their existing pitches as possible if they desire. Further design work is still ongoing uh, regarding the design of the stalls and before the final location of each trader is agreed, a, the final location 
accommodation for these uh, occupiers will be outlined in an agreement for lease. In the interim, some of the traders will need to relocate during construction works, and some will operate from temporary container facilities. And during that period, they will not be able to operate under their existing leases because the leases themselves are location specific. Instead, the traders will operate under temporary lease arrangements in alternative premises. And once new permanent premises are provided or completed, at this point, they will be given a new full lease. Traders not being relocated will continue to operate under the leases they have today with a variation agreed with them until the market construction is completed and the new leases will come into effect thereafter. In paragraph 8.2 of the officer's report, uh, we set out the financial provisions being made in respect to the traders, which again are significantly different from the CPO scheme. In respect of the arches, the CPO inspector found that there was no clarity as to the cost or prospects of upgrading the arches. As explained in the officer's report in paragraph 3.13, the repair and conditions of the brickwork of the railway, railway arches is the responsibility of TfL. The applicant's view, which may not be accepted by some objectors, is that the existing conditions of the arches is generally sound. There is, a com there is a commitment by the applicant to carry out repairs to the arches, including cleaning the brickwork of the arches and restoring them to their original condition. The applicant is also prepared to install basic water management systems to deal with uh, drainage issues. The applicant's view, which may, um, sorry, the applicant has committed to providing all the traders with the t a £10,000 credit with their contractors to invest and upgrade their units, improve water ingress issues and the quality of the arches. Finally, the CPO inspector noted an impasse between the market traders and the developer and a lack of binding enforceable measures to secure the replacement premises would be suitable and affordable enough for the traders to return to the site in sufficient numbers and to maintain the market's character, which is a key issue under policy WCRA3. This is not the case with these proposals. As explained in the officer report, a substantial number of traders have already agreed heads of terms and a form of lease has been agreed. The Section 106 agreement will seek to secure that a proportion of the traders must have entered into a formal legal arrangement before commencement of the market redevelopment. Accordingly, the reasons given by the CPO inspector for recommending that the CPO was not confirmed do not apply to the current proposals for the reasons set out in the officer's report. Overall, the position in respect to the existing leases and arrangements for the market traders have been considered and, as pointed out, are covered under Section 106. Therefore, um, as set out previously uh, in my in my last uh, presentation and as per the committee report, this application is recommended for approval subject to conditions, uh, section 106 and subject to referral to the Mayor of London. Okay, John, thank you very much for your report. Now we move on to registered speakers. Um, so I'd like to ask Jake Sims, um, speaking in objection, to please uh, take his seat. And you have five minutes, Jake, whenever you're ready. Thank you. We know who U Capital are, and we know exactly what this development proposes to do. U Capital are a multi-billion pound real estate investment firm 
who see this development as a short-term speculative attempt to maximize profits for their investors. They purchased the market through the U Capital Investment Fund too. Um, that fund documents to their investors promise that they plan to sell the market within eight to 10 years of having purchased it after the development is complete. And they've promised investors returns of two to 2.5 times the return on investment. Now, the way they're going to maximize that profit, as we have outlined extensively, is by reducing the number of traders in the market who are on protected transport for London leases. We've already explained how 25 of those traders have already left the market since you capital became owners, and a significant number plan to sell their lease and retire within the near future. Nothing that was we just heard from the planning officer addressed the point I made about how new traders do not have the same protections as long-term traders on protected transport for London leases. Those new traders, rents and service charge levels can be increased to an unlimited degree because they have no legal protections under the 1954 Landlord and Tenants Act as the older traders do. Now, none of this is surprising, not, and we wouldn't expect anything different from a multi-billion pound real estate developer, but what is completely unacceptable is the council's continued failure to take these concerns seriously and to even meet with local community members who object. Um, I want to address one specific point made by the planning officer about um, the Shepherd's Bush Market Tenants Association and the fact that the new lease agreements for older traders have been um, developed in consultation with the association. The association have three committee members. In the financial year of 2022 to 23, they did not hold a single meeting in violation of their constitution. They also did not collect any membership fees for that year, again, in violation of their constitution. The first time these new lease agreements were presented to the wider group of traders was in September of this year. That meeting was not an opportunity for the traders to be consulted on those lease agreements. It was the three committee members and their lawyers suddens presenting these um, agreements. The council have failed to step in to ensure that all traders are meaningfully consulted on these new lease agreements, which significantly weaken the terms and conditions of the existing Transport for London leases. Um, since the meeting two weeks ago, we've again been denied meetings. The former chair of the Traders Association, James Harada, requested to speak at this meeting and was denied by the council. Um, with, with the long-term future of the market and everything in the section 106 is, does not, is not relevant beyond the short and medium-term future. For example, the obligation that 10% of units must have a 20% discount for market rent only applies for 10 years. So, it, I mean, it's only 10% of units, which is actually less than what was stipulated in the previous um, 2011 planning application, for which 20% of the market had to be reserved for small and, and medium-sized businesses. There are no planning obligations to stop bigger companies, bigger chain stores from moving into this market. This planning application paves the way for the gentrification, the irreversible gentrification of Shepherd's Bush Market and the end of Shepherd's Bush Market as an affordable and diverse market serving the local community. Okay, thank you very much, Jake. Thank you for your for your comments. Um, okay, now I'd like to ask some speakers in support of the application. So I'd like to ask Andrew Thorpe, Anisa Magani, Steve Gupta, and Peter Wheeler, however you'd like to um, address the committee. And you have five minutes between you whenever you're ready. Thank you. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for your time. Over the last three years, we've worked with the Shepherds Bush Traders Association and the proposed shed tonight, those those images today with the support of the traders being here. The market needs investment to survive. Our plans provide this while respecting the character of the market and the individuality of its businesses. We are proposing to improve the infrastructure of the market and provide a five and a half million pound package of support for the traders that includes compensation, new, new units or investment into existing units, rent freezes and new long-term leases with the same protections as the existing leases. We have set up a market academy that provides free training and support. Anyone can attend, so, and so far, 100 people have been to the academy, and eight new traders have joined the market as a result. Our plans include measures that respond to the issues raised in the speaker's objection, and we are happy to have these in the section 106. These measures include a trader steering group, a long-term leasing strategy created with trader input and smaller store sizes for affordable entry points into the market. 
Many arches are being upgraded and we've committed to £10,000 or the installation of a basic working water management system to improve their condition. Aligning with the borough's industrial strategy, we are creating an innovation hub in the commercial building next door. It will be spearheaded by Imperial College and will include a life science incubator. We are also proud to have exceeded the expectations on affordable housing in this proposal. All the housing is affordable and 90% of the homes will be family size accommodation. The approval of this application will mean a lot to us and many of the people in this room. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. Are there any others that would like to address the committee? Yeah, one of you already. Thank you. Dear Planning Committee, I proudly stand here as a tenant of, of Shepherd's Bush Market for over 20 years, and I'm advocating for this development proposal. What sets it apart is a management team that's more than just names on papers. On paper, they're on the ground. They have been for the last two or three years. We know each and each and every one of them. They know us by name, and we are on a journey together. This development isn't just about structures. It's about nurturing a thriving community. Initiatives such as the Market Academy, run by Reimagine, employed by U Capital, have certainly engaged me and taught this old trader some new tricks. Quite simply, we had a good landlord with the Transport of London, an absent landlord with Orion, but an engaging, forward-thinking landlord with U Capital. We believe in this vision and urge your support for the evolution of Shepherd's Bush Market. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yep, whenever you're ready, thank you. Good evening. Change brings about fear, anxiety, and stress. The heart and soul of the market are the traders. The market had been thriving for many decades, but sadly over the last 13 years or so, it has declined rapidly and is in need of an urgent makeover. Your vision can only get better and brighter with U Capital. Therefore, on behalf of the Gold Oak traders, we wish both U Capital and the market traders to move together from strength to strength. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And are there any final speakers? Yes, whenever you're ready. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Um, my name is Peter Wheeler. I'm the chairman of the Shepherd Bush. Tenants Market Association, which is a long-standing organisation which promotes the safety and security of the traders of the market. Currently, 80% of the traders belong to the association. Throughout the last century, the market has been a thrived to go to new places for many of the residents and visitors alike in London. But we are aware of the decades of lack of investment in infrastructure and clear and constructive plans for the market has finally taken its toll. We have navigated the choppy waters over the last few years to guide ourselves in this position we have now. And we built a solid working relationship with UK capital and imagine agents for the benefit of the whole market. We originally held an AGM when we were pleased to say that over 65 members came to the meeting. The high number of attendees is, I believe, because we consider that the members realise that this is the future of the market cannot rest on its laurels. And members do appreciate that whilst there has been some compromise to move this project forward. It is important to the future the safeguards combined with our previous leases and included in the new leases, some of which have already been emailed to our members already. My father was once chairman of this association for, for, for some 40 years, and he'd be astounded to see how this market had deteriorated for a number of years. We were lucky to say that we have a, a landlord which is forward thinking and proactive and helped the traders on many occasions in this project going ahead. Many of the customers who visit the market are regulars and have found us when they arrived in England back in the 50s, the 60s and the 70s, and have supported us to this day. We all speak to them on a daily basis. Now, pleased to see that the changes we have brought, and I think that the overhaul of the market is long overdue. They are especially pleased when we tell them that the market is not closing and will be not shut during the proposed development. And the SMBTA are working well with U Capital to make sure that this is advertised well during the development success. Street markets do not exist in the format that we once knew. Traditional type of trader are a thing of the past. Today's London markets are unrecognisable from how they were in the heyday. However, we believe, and due to our members also believe, and our customers, that with the appropriate and considerate development from New Capital, Shepherd Bush Market has the ability to endure for at least another 100 years. 
and I must make one postscript. Um, uh, things were said about the um, planning committee, Matt Butler, John Sanchez, and we fully endorse that they are a very, very, very proactive team, and they've been very helpful to us, and been very transparent, and helped us along the way, and we thank them for it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your patience and understanding. It's a very important matter. Merry Christmas. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, now we move on to committee members, <clears throat> excuse me, questions for officers. And I am going to use my uh, chair's discretion here to question the applicant as well. Andrew, if you're happy to, to take a seat there and, and uh, committee members may ask you questions as they, as they come and go. Right, so now we can move on to uh, questions for officers. And would anyone like to start with the questions? Yes, Councillor Harcourt. <clears throat> Thank you. Just a couple of quick questions um, about general matters before we move on to some more substantive issues. The first one, I'm not, not quite clear about this, is this issue about the previous planning application and the compulsory purchase order. I understand from what you were saying that the compulsory purchase order was turned down by the courts, but what about the actual planning permission? Was that uh, declined as well, or was that... It, Excellent. And was it not? Um, did it not go through simply because the compulsory purchase order was um, refused? I'm, I'm not clear on the actual situation there. Uh, through the chair, the outline planning permission granted in March 2012 was challenged. Uh, the challenge did fail. There was a decision in 2013. Um, it wasn't able to be implemented though because it involves land as part of the CPO, which had been quashed um subsequently in 2016 so the application um was never implemented it couldn't be thank you that's cleared that one up um the next one area was this issue of the new building the residential building which is listed as being um affordable uh it seems to be challenged by one of the by the objector can you just tell me what is affordable, what isn't, what, how much of it is uh, London uh, living rent, et cetera, the various breakdowns? Um, yes, through the chair, the, there are 40 residential units. It's 100% affordable. It's 60% uh, London affordable rent, 40% intermediate. So that equates to 24 social rent units and 16 intermediate. Thank you. And was is there any time? There was a suggestion that some of that was time limited. No, that's not the case. Do we know how many of the traders have actually signed up new leases? Through the chair, um, 67 of the legacy traders, um, and that 90% of those who've signed the heads of terms, which form the basis of the new leases, the subsequent discussions and the more detail are obviously specific to the tenants, but that's the main vehicle, the heads of terms, which sets out the financial issues, etc. cetera. So that's 60 old. Chair, 60 is the figure, actually, yeah. So 90% of the 67. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. That, that, that Those were just points of clarification in my own mind. Um, I do have some other issues, but uh, if other members want to ask questions, I'll come back. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I, I've got a question of my own, just with regards to the Tenants Association. So what is the uh, membership of the Tenants Association, if you can give a figure? Um, and if you can give a percentage as well. I know that one of the speakers suggested that it wasn't representative, and then another speaker suggested that it was represented up, up to 80%. So if you could just clarify that for us.
Yes, yeah, sorry, in paragraph 8.2, I state in total 53 of the existing 67 legacy traders, 79% are members of Shepherds Bush Market Traders Association. And there are also 11 temporary traders that there are members as well. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Now, do we have any other questions? Yes, Councillor Carmel. Find the mic. Um, I do have a number of problems uh, with this application, and I will uh, ask uh, officers for some clarification on some of them, uh, whilst on others I will make my own mind up. Um, if I could just start, uh, I feel that it is completely improper uh, you to invite a representative of the applicant to come up uh, to be able to answer questions without asking Mr Sims also to make himself available. What is fair for one should be fair for the others. And I know we haven't actually asked him any questions yet, but there is no provision in the standing orders for uh, uh, applicants to ask questions and you are using your discretion to do so. And I just want you to note uh, my concern um, at this matter, and just carrying on. Well, Councillor Carmel, I can I can come in on that. So I, I've checked that with legal, and and they've told me that that's completely compliant for me to use my discretion to ask the applicant to speak. The the reasoning there is that, of course, we have the applicant present. There will be sort of material questions that that many of the committee members will have that only the applicant may be able to answer. So I I feel that it's very important that we have that opportunity to do so. Um, and and that's as I say been been approved by legal and checked. I will be no, I will be raising this with legal. Uh, various other London councils have have various standing orders that allow uh, applicants and objectors to be questioned, and they are written into standing orders. Uh, but my essential point is, I'm not complaining about the fact that you've allowed the representative of the applicant up, but I think I think it's only fair and proper if Mr. Sims was also. Uh, allowed to sit at the table and to answer any questions that he might have, because it is, and I, I, I don't know whether legal will say, uh, whether it is fair and proper to only invite one side of uh, an application up and give them in contravention of standing orders, and it is a contravention of standing orders, and I know you had chats with legal, but I think it is, uh, in my opinion, improper and possibly subject to judicial review to only invite one side up. And I'm just trying to preserve the position of the planning authority. But uh, would, would legal say um, that it is completely fair and proper to only invite one side up to answer questions and not to ask the principal objector? <laughs> Sure, sure. Councillor Connor, I take your point and I'll let legal come in on this. There is provision for both the applicant and objectors to speak. And I've, of course, used my chair's discretion to ask the applicant to speak. But if the committee would so wish the objector to also be questioned, then, of course, I'm happy to use my discretion to do that as well. But, but I'll, I'll give way to legal on this just for clarification. Um, for clarification, where we've used this under Councillor Connor is, uh, is under... Then is under the public speaking and planning committee's part five, where the chair would not normally allow comments in this, where we've allowed it under. It, it, I've noted that the chair has said that he'll ask questions um, in opposition if needed be, so they'll have that fairness in there for that, if those are there, if those questions are such asked for by the committee. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to do that if that's what the committee um, I, would, I, would, I, would I, like. I'm just trying to do what is yes. fair and proper. You sure. have invited one side of the application forward. And I am just saying that it would only be fair and proper. We may have no questions for the applicant. We may have no questions for the opposition. But um, it's unfair and unjust just to invite one side up. And it gives um, a perception of bias uh, towards one side of the application. And, and you know, personally, I'd like to thank Mr. Sims for his, shall we say, far more tempered speech that he gave uh, to this meeting as opposed to the one where he addressed us at the last meeting where I was um, uh, somewhat perturbed by some of his language, but I think it's only right and proper that should any of the committee have any questions that he be invited to the table.
Yeah, no, I, I completely take your point, Councillor Carmel. In, in the interest of fairness, I'm happy to ask Mr Sims to, to, to come up as well. But for the avoidance of doubt, I've asked the applicant to come up so that we can question him because he will be able to answer some material questions about the application. So it's essentially a form of uh, gaining clarity for the for the committee in, in the same way that Mr Sims might not be able to. But again, as I say, I'm very happy to to ask Mr Sims to come as well, if, I, I, if that's I look, what you'd I look like. I forward to your amendments to standing orders at the next annual council meeting because this is... I think unique. Okay, well, um, if you'd like uh, to propose that Mr. Sims comes to, to present the committee, it. then I'm, I'm, I'm happy to use my discretion. The of fairness. It, it is Mr. Carmel? Is that what you'd you'd like to propose? Is that what you'd like me to do? If under Standing Order 15, I need to formally propose that we ignore standing orders and allow equality and justice to take place at this committee, then I formally propose it. Okay, perfectly happy to do that. So, so I'd also like to invite Mr. Sims to to come to the table, and as and when committee members have any questions, then then we will ask. Yeah, Mr. Sims, if you'd like to, if you'd like to take a seat, Mr. Sims. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, take uh, a seat. Can I can I can I just say, Mr. Sims, this isn't a uh, my outburst isn't a. Uh, support for you to uh, speak out without being asked any questions as I, exactly the same as it is for the applicant. You are here to assist the committee should we have any questions. Um, lovely, thank you, Mr. Sims. Sure, okay, thank you, Councillor Carmel. Now, do you have any questions? Go ahead. Again, various uh, legal questions and I completely and utterly understand the position of not just uh, the legacy traders, but the traders from uh, Shepherd's Bush Market. But in pure planning terms, legally speaking, how much weight can we as a committee attach to potential uh, increases uh, in rent levels, reductions in plot sizes, uh, reductions in security of tenancy from the 1954 Act, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, because I, I am currently, and subject to your advice, dealing with the matters that I regard as planning issues under the Town and Country Planning Act. So sunlight, daylight, uh, loss of outlook, um, and various ver various other planning matters, which is what I normally judge a planning application on. But is there weight that can be attached to the plight of the market traders? Councillor Kamal, I'm just if we can just sort of just repeat. I just need you to understand exactly in terms of the weight. I need to understand your question properly. So if I can just ask you to just briefly just summarize those points and then get them down correctly if that's all right thanks for nothing um i do i do these things off off the cuff you know um right every planning decision i make is based on the weight that i can ascribe to a particular aspect of planning policy so um what i am asking you um and I'll try and rephrase this as closely as I did the first time around, is that Mr. Sims and his supporters have stated, um, it has to be said with uh, not um, vast amounts of evidence, but uh, it's a question of belief that were the U Capital uh, proposals to go through, that the rights of the current and future market traders will be minimized. Their rents will be increased. Their plot sizes might be changed. Uh, their security of tenure under various previous legislative acts and all that, um, may be changed. Is that a planning matter for this committee uh, to ascribe planning weight to, or should we consider what I normally consider in a situation like this. Uh, and we had a, a long discussion at the last meeting on daylight and sunlight. 
Uh, we also discussed a lot of outlook, um, uh, whether um, whether the, the various prospects of the development were an unneighbourly form of development, this, that, and the other. What I want to know is, can I ascribe any weight to the complaints or the assertions of the market traders? And if so, in your opinion, how much weight? So is it slight weight, medium weight, uh, serious weight uh, should be ascribed to, to their concerns? Uh, I, hope, I hope that makes sense to you. If you may just give me one minute, Council, come out to consider your, your question. That's right. Thank you. Might be able to uh, uh, assist the committee was as to how much weight can be ascribed uh, through the chair. In normal circumstances, I, I think understanding uh, Councillor Carmel's questions that the planning wouldn't tend to dwell into landlord and tenant matters. Uh, we have. I guess an unusual situation as much as we're dealing with an historic market and we do have a local plan policy that is very clear in terms of any redevelopment of the market and adjoining land should assist market traders so they can continue to trade and remain part of the market and it's very much around the and I suppose the planning hook there is around the character and vibrancy of the market and protecting that and obviously the existing trade is an important component of that. So certainly in planners, um, consideration of the application, we felt that protection of the traders did fall to be considered as part of a material planning consideration, as indeed applications have to comply with the local plan unless material considerations determine otherwise. Answer, Mr. Butler. Um, Councillor Carmel, do, do you want to move on to another question, or you want to wait till I think? Lee? Yeah. I think Mr. Butler, give me. Uh, okay. Sure. Go ahead. And and your mic. Your mic. Yeah. My, my I think it still might be off. So I can't see the green. Yeah. Now it's on. Now it's on. Yeah. Um, my principal concerns are over sunlight and daylight, particularly over Pennard Road. Um, and we had a long discussion at the last time, and I think I've come to a conclusion as to which way I, I'm going to go, and this is just a comment. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carmel. Do we have any other questions? Uh, yes, Councillor Walsh. Thank you. I was not sure was it on this presentation or was it the uh, presentation on sunlight um, that was presented at the last meeting. Would it be possible to bring up the drawing where the tube and the, I believe it's the, the apartments are in line with one another? <laughs> yeah, I think this one may suffice. My question is in terms of obviously the tube and the apartments are basically on a parallel level in is there any concern that officers may have about the, the level of noise and disturbance that may be experienced by these new residents i do note in the i think it was the other presentation where the properties on the opposite side most of them didn't actually have windows on the side of the tube presumably as a noise mitigation measure is there any concern in that regard um obviously officers note the location of the residential building is close to to um the underground line um it has been designed so effectively residential units um and do have both um, mechanical and passive uh, ventilation also that the um as you can see on the on the left hand side image there you uh, the majority of the reunits are actually recessed back, so there's a there is a there is a sort of a a deck courtyard at first floor level. So we're just talking about few windows that effectively uh, in terms of closest proximity to 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 the tube line. But overall, um, um, the officers have considered uh, the noise and vibration assessments and and council's um, environmental 
um, protection team were were satisfied with the details. So you're satisfied that no additional measures may be needed uh, to mitigate noise or vibrations? That's correct. Okay, um, moving along. My next question is uh, just in terms of the uh, the hoardings that will surround the building or the site during the time of construction. Obviously, appreciate that it is noted on it that there's to be no advertisements on um, the hoardings during that time. These often end up being fly posted. Is there any sort of agreement that would need possible to insert to ensure that these are satisfactorily uh, maintained and updated to so that any sort of fly posting is removed and that the general appearance of the hoarding remains, I think the wording that uses satisfactory uh, in the find it. Sure, the satisfactory external appearance. I ask that question purely in the event that, which often does happen, of fly posting on uh, building hoardings uh, during the development period. Um, well, in this particular case, the, the 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 hoardings themselves are actually through the market itself, so it's effectively separating and protecting the market from from the commercial buildings to to uh, from the commercial and residential buildings to the to the east so uh, in effect the holdings are actually within the applicant's own remit rather than being on a for example on a public highway um again the condition primarily the condition is put on to prevent general advertising we don't prevent obviously advertising which is included to explain the development or provide images of the development so clearly clearly that we would accept that but in this particular case i think officers are satisfied that as the site as, as the hoarding is predominantly within the the market site itself there's sufficient measures to prevent any fly fly posting certainly and then just uh one last question for now is in your presentation uh you mentioned the need to relocate some of the traders during uh the period of construction can you just clarify just to be explicit, that the relocations will be on the site. They will not be relocated off site or to other locations around the borough. That's correct. Um, the intention is to um, relocate some of the containers that are on the, the old laundry yard and that for them to be used as, as sort of temporary um, trading facilities. They're all, they are all within the market remit. Um, some of the traders will, may even move into existing existing premises um, that are vacant at the moment. So it would be a combination of um, existing units or uh, within the temporary containers, but they're all within the red line. And just as a point of clarification, would those structures be subject to a separate planning uh, agreement or will they be able to be put in place without needing to apply for a separate planning permission? No, they're, they're actually, it's all included within this current application. So within the the general phase in what the as part of the, the demolition and construction works of both the commercial and residential buildings we've got the temporary facilities included as well perfect thank you and, and sorry john where exactly will they be if you can show us um on a map yes so um in terms of this aerial image here um, most of the, most of the containers would be located at the the southern end, closest to the Goldhawk <coughs> Road entrance. Okay, thank you. Now I've got a, a number of questions. Firstly, a question to to officers and uh, Jake, if you'd like to to come in on this as well, once officers are, are done. The the point about the thirty three traders that have signed a letter against the application against the proposed development. I note that in the report it's not taken as 33 individual objections. It's taken as, it's mentioned all, all sort of as, as one petition or, or one letter. And I'd be grateful if you could just clarify that, why that wasn't taken as 33 individual objections and if there's any background on that and if you can just give us some, some more information on that. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, the issue with it was it, it was a covering email with a, with a headline and there was a link in the email to an external website that included 
photographs of individual performers with the same headline been signed by individuals. We were advised in the covering letter that we shouldn't share the information about where, where they were from or the names. We indicated that we would, we would have to treat it as a, effectively a petition, but one where we couldn't identify or verify people involved because of the, the request that had come. So in, in practice, what the difference is that we didn't upload 33 individual objections because we didn't have any authority to do so as the, as the individuals concerned hadn't written to us under the planning application that had signed these things and they'd been then uploaded onto a website. So although we, we refer to them as a, as a sort of covering email with 33 um, uh, alleged traders attached to it, we, we couldn't upload it as 33 individual objections without some or all of those traders deciding that they wanted to forward their own forms to us, which obviously by definition would verify their intent. So that's, that, it's, it's a nuance, but that's the distinction. It doesn't mean we haven't had regard to it. It merely means we can't hand on heart to regard them as 33 individual objections from the individuals concerned because they didn't send them to us. Sure. And has any, been work, has any work been done, sorry, to investigate the 33, to contact them individually? Uh, has, has it been verified that they are either for or against the application? Has there been any independent work done to, no. to assess that? There was a limit to what you could do, obviously, without without the information. What's what happened subsequently, just before the fifth meeting, was that um, a letter came in with with effectively the information that was on the individual photographs was then re replicated at the bottom of the letter. The, the problem with that is that doesn't authorize anything either. It merely translates what's on the photograph into the letter. It doesn't help us with whether or not these people are happy for their views to be presented to us as objections or not. So from our perspective, there wasn't a great deal we could do because we weren't able to, to use the information or we've been asked not to use the information. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't want to imply that that means that we're suspicious of whether they are or aren't traders, simply that we couldn't go through the exercise. Okay, do any other officers want to come in on that? No? Jake, would you you like to just provide some background on that, how the signatures were acquired, and if you have any any anything further to add, go ahead. Yeah, so as a community group, we've been working very closely with market traders for the past 18 months. Um, the wording of that statement was drafted jointly by a group of traders and by ourselves. Um, we then, yeah, over, over a period of six months, gathered, gathered signatures from traders um, and got to 33 traders. Um, which we provided evidence of all the signatures to the council. Um, there's some extremely important context to include here, which is the long history of traders with concerns being intimidated and bullied by U Capital. This started in 2021 with the Heads of Times agreements, which were mentioned earlier to yourself um, in answer to the question about how many traders have signed new leases. The Heads of Times documents included confidentiality clauses which where the le the legality of that gagging clause was ambiguous again this is something we've raised with the planning officers repeatedly but they have not investigated since then when the planning application was proposed to by U capital U capital executives went around the market with a device going into traders shops and units with a template and getting them to put their names to submit supportive statements of course there were traders who support that application and we are not disputing that of course there are but that it's a clear power imbalance when your landlord is putting pressure on you to submit a supportive response um two weeks ago when this meeting happened um you capital clearly got hold of that list despite our efforts to ensure that traders that they didn't to protect traders because of the history of intimidation um they then went round the market questioning every trader who signed that statement and putting pressure on them to sign a new statement, which I'm assuming they've shared with you, um, in support of the application. We received and we received comments directly from traders saying that they felt forced to sign that new statement in support of the plans because they would be pushed out of the market if not. That applies particularly to traders on precarious contracts, not the Transport for London leases. And as mentioned earlier, this is all in the context of the council officers having failed to extensively consult with traders as a wider body 
rather they have undertaken all that consultation with Seddons and the three members of the Trades Association specifically, without the association or Seddons doing extensive consultation with the wider group of traders as to their views. Everyone knows the market needs investment, and I think you struggle to find a trader who disagreed with that. However, the terms and conditions of the leases and the details of the planning application and what it does or doesn't do to protect their long-term future in the market is absolutely critical for a huge number of traders as to their views on the application. And we would argue that for, given, as mentioned earlier, the local plan specifically states the need to safeguard traders and to add to what the planning officer stated, it's also stated um, in the London plan, policy E9, that um, where justified by evidence of local need, policy should secure affordable commercial and shop units secured through planning conditions or planning obligations as appropriate. So both the local plan and the London plan make clear that this is a planning concern. And we believe that in order to meaning for you to be able to meaningfully be able to make a decision as to whether the application is compliant with those planning laws, there would need to be much wider and more meaningful consultation with traders where you can ensure that the views that have been submitted to the council are not under duress but under pressure from their landlord who have enormous amounts of pressure to affect their future livelihoods in the um in the negotiation of the leases that is to come which has not yet happened um as well as the power to kick traders out of the market altogether as they have recently done with a couple of traders on short-term contracts not the protected leases because as mentioned earlier those traders have no legal protections to prevent abuses of power from from your capital Okay, thank you very much, Jake. Uh, thank you for that. So I just want clarification. So the total number of traders is is 87. Is that right? If you take the permanent and the temporary traders uh, as a total figure, if you could just put your mics on before you, you answer, please. Thank you. There are 80... Uh... 86 traders operating in the market um 67 of these are legacy traders um with um 76 leases and then there's 19 temporary traders okay and did you want to come in again sorry chair just to clarify on, on, on the matters about the, the consultation um for the avoidance of that one yeah and if you could just move the mic slightly forward just so everyone can hear thank you the Thanks. statutory consultations that we do on any planning application are very much the same, other than scale. In this particular case, we sent individual letters to all of the traders who were on the market. You know, we don't. It's up to the traders whether they want to make representations, not whether they want to be for or against. But that's that is the vehicle for it. Anyone who makes a representation via the website or, or directly to us, those those records are uploaded against the planning records because there's no ambiguity. They're coming from the people we've written to and they're expressing their views to us. Where we have a problem is if somebody's purporting to, to sort of represent a view on behalf of other people and we don't have that authorization, that, that's that's where it becomes difficult. The, the, the conversation previously there was a lot about what you capital have or haven't done allegedly. That's separate and distinct from what the council does as part of the, with this planning authority hat on. You know, we, we are bound by the requirements of legislation in terms of how we uh, publicize the applications and who we write to. And we, we go far and above that in normal circumstances. Yeah, thank you. I understand that. So whether or not uh, the, or, or the manner in which you capital may or may not have um, done their own consultation is besides the point because the council also carried out its own full consultation process. I wouldn't say it's beside the point because it feeds into what we'd expect on a scheme of this size, you know, a community engagement prior to any application coming in. But it's not part of the statutory consultation. That's part, that's the local planning authority's responsibility. And we do that when the application is submitted. What happens before, you know, it might be important and it might set the groundwork, but it's not part of that statutory process. Sure. And, and again, just for clarity and just for the purposes of, of every committee member to, to be completely clear on this, in response to the statutory consultation carried out by the council, what were the responses for and against? And what was the sort of turnout? You know, how many of the market traders responded, how many didn't? And, and then what was the breakdown? Um, we received 125 or 26 objections. Sorry, John, if you could just just with reference to the traders. Oh, the so, traders. Yeah. Um, 
I think we received six objections from traders, although some of them were duplicates, and we had 50 in about or 47 in support. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me just check that. Yeah, sure. Just double check that. Yeah. Just sorry, just while John's doing that, just to add to that, obviously the Traders Association as well made a representation, and we had a representation. Uh, we had a side so which is from the lawyers acting on behalf of the uh, Traders Association, uh, and then we had a, the Traders Association taking the advice that the lawyers had given them. So we, you know, we had the individuals, but we also had the organisation uh, representing the individuals as well. Yes, sorry, I just want to confirm that again. So it's uh, we had six objections, individual objections. There were three from one one um, um, one of the arches, and and there were two representations from um, from people that occupied an arch a stall, and and oh, sorry, two arches and a stall. So six objections in total, and we had forty seven individual representations in support so just to be clear the six objections contain um contain some duplicates that you just mentioned but the 47 don't contain any duplicates again um not, not necessarily they're they're duplicates they're just obviously the, the, the same occupier has made more than one representation um, we wouldn't, if there was an exact duplicate, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we'd just count it as one objection. So they've just made further representations. Um, I'm just, I'm just indicating of the six, three, three were from one, one occupier. Um, and in terms of the, in terms of the um, letters of support, so I'm just looking down the list. I think most of them, I think there are a couple where there is more than one um yeah, there's a couple of shops where there's they've sent more than one, but the majority are actually individual representations. If you could get the exact number, that that would be that would be useful. I mean, we'll move on to another question in the meantime. But if you could, in the meantime, just give me the exact figure. So you said out of the six objections, three were from one occupier. So there are a number of um, objections that came from the same person. Um, uh, from from a number of objections that came from the same uh, traders. And you said 47 in favor and a couple of them. But if you could give me the exact figure, just so we know for, for certain. And while you're doing that, I will move on. If, if one of the other officers could could um, answer some of these questions. So you mentioned. Yeah, sure. Sure. Councillor Harvey, go ahead. Sorry, I wanted to ask some questions before we move on in relation to that. So if there are some duplicates within the support, it would be good to know that exact figure. Um, but it also kind of adding and looking at those, there's quite a lot of traders that haven't either objected or supported the application. Is that right? And how many roughly is that? And then going to the point Miss Sims um, made around um, around Yo Capital allegedly going to places to get people to sign a statement. I'm really confused why they would do that. What is the benefit? Has any of that fed into any further development or decision? Why, why is that being done exactly? I'd really like to have some clarity around that. And Councillor Harvey, if I may, would you be happy for the applicant to also answer part of your question or just the officers? Uh, I think it's probably best from the officers, actually, because I think we don't want to get into a debate between applicant and objector. I'm sorry. I mean, there's there's not much we can say about that. I mean, it's it's sort of you know, it, it's a perception, or it's 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 a different point of the argument. One side says this, the other one says not. We have no evidence for or against. I mean, that you know, as far as we're concerned, we we act in good faith on representations that were given that are given to us, whether they're for or against or neutral. What we can't do is, is acknowledge representations being from individuals that they don't actually come from those individuals. We can acknowledge them as having been received, but we're not in a position to take a view on whether they, you know, there's consent for them to be shared or not. And the same with these, you know, if individuals are prepared to sign a form physically and that is then photographed and put on the online, 
we're not able to understand, you know, what the thinking was at that time, what what it was that they thought they were signing up to. It, it just is what it is. So there's a limit to how much we can kind of um, add to the discussion, other than to maybe acknowledge that, well, in, in that particular case, there were th three photographs of 33 individual forms that seemingly had been signed by 33 individuals, but they weren't forwarded to us by those individuals, and we have no notion of understanding, you know, what it was they thought they were signing up to. Can I just clarify? So, are you clear who those individuals are? Are they market traders? They or? Were, we were we were clear in the sense that the, when the email came to us with a link to these photographs, there were we were able to read the names on the photographs and the addresses. We were explicitly told not to share those names and addresses, which we wouldn't do anyway. So, you know. They were genuine in the sense that they had signatures on them and they had they had an address on them and they were at the same banner headline on them. The only thing that varied was the fact that none of these had been sent to us by those individuals and therefore we were asked to to take a, a, on faith the fact that these individuals wanted those representations presented to us on their behalf. And the only way we can do that normally is when they actually write to us as part of the planning process and, and then, you know, it's, it's their decision where they... Where they right or not and we would then record those against the planning record so again you know we've recorded them as been received but we haven't uploaded them as 33 separate individuals we've objected we've recorded it as a covering email from from the organization and a link to individual forms signed forms that have been photographed and uploaded on there can I just clarify? It appears that there may be thirty-three objectors, trade trade market, who have object uh, objected to the application. We, well, we, but we can't take it into account because they didn't follow the right process. The there was a the subsequent list that was sent in on the bottom of the letter before the last committee, effectively took the names and the addresses and put them in the bottom of the letter. So in that sense, those are now public. We are able to confirm on the back of that that we know that 13 of the 33 are traders because the information has now been made public, not not by us, but you know by others. So it, it, it wouldn't be the case that all, that all 33 of them weren't, but we can't verify that all 33 of them are either. We can say as much on the 13 because of the information that was made public ahead of the fifth. Sorry, through the chair, just to add, I, it, it, we did note it, obviously, in the report and stuff, but it, it was fair to say we could give it limited weight because the individuals themselves hadn't made representations direct to us. We were also, and in the weight we gave it, we were also mindful that we had significant number of... Yeah, yeah sorry, could you turn your mic off? Yes, thank you. Right sorry. into us in support, and obviously the numbers can be clarified hopefully in a minute. Uh, we were also very mindful of considering this uh, representation from um, Save Our Shepherds Bush Market in the context also that the Traders Association had written in in support of it, and they represented 80, approximately 80% 80 of the traders. We are also mindful of the solicitors appointed by the Tennis Association who had also uh, written uh identifying they were happy with the terms of the leases that are being agreed for the legacy traders the 67 permanent legacy traders as they're termed at the market and then following also the fact that as part of any permission there would need to be documentation signed as detailed in the committee report around the market leases that at least 60% of the legacy traders would have to be signed up to the relevant documentation, which is essentially the heads of terms, which would be reflected in the agreement for lease. And a number of the, the securities are identified in paragraph 8.28 of the committee report. And then subsequently, a further, um, what would represent 48 in total. So a, th a further... 12 would have to sign up within six months of the development and then um, 60 um, in total within 12 months of 
the commencement of the market refurbishment work. So that's all detailed in the commission report. So, you know, we had to consider these apparent concerns from 33 traders who hadn't written to us separately, but had become a part of an organization who didn't want to be the details, um, if you like, made uh, public. We had to consider it all within that that context. So yes, we looked at it, but the weight was clearly limited in what we could give it. Councillor Harvey, do you have any follow Just on that, Chair. Sorry, yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah. I mean, John has just reminded me, I guess it sheds some light on the confusion as well, because some of those 33 who'd signed those forms, effectively objecting, had actually written in support as well. So it was very difficult to sort of try and work out, you know, what was going on, whether they were there, thought they were signing something else or whether they had the knowledge and they changed their mind. So it wasn't simply the names, but with the names now we can compare it with the fact that they seemingly had two different opinions that have been expressed, you know, in response to the consultation exercise. Sure, John, just before you come in, sorry, and, and I will come to you, Councillor Carmel, but so this, this was the, the sort of question that I wanted to ask. In the in the process of the statutory consultation, uh, did you find that any of the 33 names had actually responded differently? And you kind of answered the question already. For example, did any of the 33 who'd signed the letter objecting actually respond to the statutory consultation approving or, or, be, or in favour of the development? And if so, how many of them? And and John, yeah, if you'd like to. Come. Yeah, I was just I was just going to give you a response to that. Of of those of those thirty three, we cross referenced the individual representations. Um, thirteen were identified, and um, uh, sorry, thirteen were identified as uh, as making separate representation. Of those, eleven wrote in support, and two had written in and objecting. <clears throat> so 11 of the 33 responded separately to the statutory consultation in support of this scheme. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carmel. Um, thank you. I, I'll just do a general comment about uh, uh, the consultation and uh, bearing in mind uh, uh, what Mr. Sims has said, that uh, while some of the people who wrote in in support, I think it is not in completely unlikely that those who wrote in publicly in support wrote private, privately in objection because of the fear, rightly or wrongly, that uh, they felt might occur were their objection to become publicly known. Um, also on the, uh, the subject of consultation and the statutory consultation which the council has taken, taken um, has undertaken, there is also on, on the planning file for this application uh, a document called the Statement of Community Involvement, which follows, or SCI to the Cognoscenti, uh, which follows the adoption of the Council's Statement of Community Involvement, November 2015? Yeah. Um, which sets out, out what applicants are supposed to do to consult with with locals prior to submitting an application. And I've had, a, I've had a look through that and whatever the rights and wrongs of the application, I am of the opinion, having looked through this document, that the applicant significantly um, uh, consulted above and beyond the requirements of the council's own statement of uh, community involvement. But my main question, having got rid of the consultation, um, uh, question and uh, is to something that Mr. Sims said at uh, his last meeting, and I think I heard during uh, uh, one of the very few quiet parts of the meeting, where he was talking about um, the costs of waterproofing uh, the railway arches, and if memory serves me right, and my hearing was a little... Um, impaired, shall we say. Um, if I understand it correctly, U Capital have agreed to undertake the uh, payment of up to £10,000 for each and every railway arch um, leaseholder. 
uh, but I think Mr. Sim said that uh, one had recently undertaken it and the costs were over £75,000 um, uh, for that. And I also note that um, whilst uh, we're talking about um, things, uh, looking at the Statement of Community Involvement, which is published on our planning portal, so it's a public do document, uh, under paragraph 6.4, and in particular 6.41, which is called the Heads of Terms meeting, it said, from July 2021 until late 2022, you capital held meetings with each trader, blah, 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 blah. The Heads of Terms are non-binding documents that sets out the support that traders will receive through development and beyond. Blah, blah, blah. And while these documents are non-binding, uh, you capital will be obligated to paper a percentage of the heads of terms into an agreement for lease if and when resolution to grant planning permission is received from LBHF. Uh, you will not be able to start works until this, this percentage is met. And then a couple of paragraphs later, it says, to date, over 90% of traders have agreed heads of terms and cons conversations are ongoing with those who have not yet agreed. I think the percentages that we've heard during the meeting are slightly different than 90% uh, of traders having agreed heads of terms. And I wondered if we could have an update on exactly uh, where we are. This is a, a document prepared by U Capital and submitted to the, uh, the council as part of their application. So um, I'm, I'm just a little confused as to what the actual percentages are. Is it really over 90%? Uh, through the chair, it relates primarily to the legacy traders, the 67 legacy traders. So 60 of those who signed the heads of terms, which is rounded up as 90%. Do you have any follow-up? No? Okay. Um, actually, something that Councillor Carmel, I, I will come to other members, uh, Councillor Carmel said was, was um, made me think. So 33 of those, the people that signed that letter, you say 11 of them wrote in separately in favour of the application. Of the six who wrote in objecting to the application, to the statutory consultation, um, were any of them on any separate lists in favour of the application. So the other way around, did that happen the other way around? And no, that's not the case, no. No, so they, they um, the, the six objectors were objected from the app, the application from, from the outset, and two of them are included within those 33 referred to as well. Okay, thank you. And did you have the figures to share? Yes, in terms of the, the six objections, three are from traders, because the main thing here is obviously that one thing is are traders, the other things are are the leases, and clearly some some traders may have a, an arch, they may also have a shop, or may they have, may have a stall. So, in term obviously in terms of how they're listed, um, in terms of the objectors. Um, to, um, one of the traders has has two arches and one stall. That's an example. And then if you go to the to the the letters of support, so I've listed forty seven different representations that are coming from in support. There are five of them which are effectively they wrote in more than once. Um, but there are other examples where um, someone wrote in, in support and they own two shops, for example, or they may own an arch, uh, sorry, a shop and a stall. So it, it's very difficult to quantify it in terms of numbers. Obviously, all we can re refer to is the actual individual representations that we received. And, and, and as indicated earlier, of, of the, uh, the 100 and... 103 that we received, um, I cross reference 47 of those as being traders. Okay, so out of 86 traders, roughly 50 responded to the statutory consultation. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a fair number. Sure. Any other questions? 
Councillor Carcourt. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of other areas I want to look at. Uh, at the previous or the early part of this meeting, on the 5th of December, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at the uh, loss of light outlook and such like, but we didn't get to a point where we were ever able to raise any questions about it. So, uh, significantly since then, I've had a number, as I'm sure every other member has, uh, letters from residents uh, of Pennard Road um, and Pennard Mansions and Guildhall Road and so on about the loss of light and the significance of that. And tonight we've, you know, we've spent a lot of time again talking about traders and the rights and wrongs and the money and, and all the rest of it. But we haven't really looked at the effect this is going to have on the residential properties surrounding the area and when I and I'm not going to go through every one of these because there's far too many in there but just staring me in the face at the moment in one to 28 Pennard man mansions it says four bedrooms ranging from minor to major adverse reduction and the same sort of thing happens on a number of them and they quote and you quote in the report very often these are bedrooms but the letters that I've received from residents are actually talking about some of these where well, they may technically be bedrooms they're actually used for as ch for their children to do their homework homework rooms playrooms and such like and where light is equally as important as it may be in a standard living area so perhaps I could ask somebody to make some comments on that and then I've got one other area I want to look at and that's to do with carbon emissions. Yeah if any officers want to come in on that. Yes I'd like to introduce Ian Diaz who um, the council appointed as a, an independent daylight sunlight consultant to assess the planning application um, so um, his findings are included within the officer's report. Good evening. Um, those comments were in relation to the Pennard Road properties, and we were looking at the <clears throat> unencumbered windows at the end of the outriggers. And so the ground floor where extended is typically a sort of living, kitchen, dining um, room. But on the first and second floor, Typically, they would be bedrooms, and we've 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 obviously seen quite a few plans of these properties from from various um, previous applications on these and and other research. Um, so, at first and second floor, the closest windows to the development, the ones in the outrigger, are typically bedrooms, um, and we are aware that some of these. Um, some of these properties on Pennard Road have been converted to flats, but even in those situations, typically where you've got a first or second floor maisonette, we would find that um, the living room is more typically on the front because it's a larger room and still bedroom use on the back. So we can't categorically say that every single room is a bedroom, but based on review of research and um, looking at, at these properties, typically they are of bedroom use. And in terms of the BRE, it does recognise that one of the daylight tests, which is daylight distribution, it does actually state that um, daylight distribution is less important to bedrooms. Yeah, thank you for, for that. I mean, I, you know, I appreciate the technical side of what you're talking about, but um, it, the reality to people living there is that they will note there will be a noticeable reduction in in light. And when you know some of these rooms that we're talking about here, and it talks about uh, um, the uh, level of adverse effect on them, uh, you know, major adverse effect, and so on. I, I'm just concerned that the amount of uh, windows and properties that are going to be affected by this. So the BRE mythology of review is very much focused towards reduction and it sets um, parameters of when ordinarily a reduction will become noticeable. Um, and just to bear in mind, the BRE is a flexible um, guide. It's for universal approach uh, and it could be used for a a small village development or or or, or for an inner London major redevelopment. Um, but it is very much focused in on reduction. And so when we do have reductions beyond the BRE 
default target. They will be noticeable, um, ordinarily noticeable. And obviously, the bigger reductions and the, the further they are, the, these transgressions, as it were, then it will be generally more noticeable, these, these departures or transgressions from the uh, BRE default target. But the other side is that not only have we looked at the reductions, we've also looked at the retained levels. And the BRE in Appendix F does, does allow for alternative target criteria to be considered. And that is where um, a site like this, which has minimum massing currently, and obviously to redevelop it, um, some of these windows that are, are unencumbered, not recessed, but have a have a um, looking out fully over the site, have high levels of daylight. So if we follow the BRE default target, there would only be, it wouldn't take much massing to get beyond the default um, criteria as such. So we've looked at both reductions and also retained levels. Um, and that's that's why planning officers as well have have supported the alternative target approach as being reasonable. Again, again thank you for that. Um, again, what can, what can I say? My only comment really is that, um, you know, that appears, well, technically, all, everything you're saying is absolutely correct. Yeah, that's no real solace to the people living there who will experience some change. Anyway, moving on. Um, page, where are we, 238. Um, we're looking at things like carbon emissions, and I'm in particularly concerned about this, given uh, given my uh, other role in this council, which is to do with climate change. Um, I note that the um, the uh, buildings, the residential building, has got an overall carbon uh, emission reduction by 71 percent, which okay falls short of the passive house uh, standard of around about 80, but nonetheless it's pretty close to that, whereas the uh, commercial building is expected to reduce com emissions by 17%. Now, that's nowhere near the council target. It doesn't even reach the GLA targets. And overall, you say in, in that same paragraph that the whole site is achieving a 29% reduction in CO2 emissions, which again is well below both the council's target and the GLA targets. 238. Wait, 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 wait. Two oh five. Oh. Yeah, it's definitely two three eight paragraph twelve point two six. Some sometimes the numbering is different. But did you want to carry on with the question? No, 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 no that's as far yeah. as I've got. Okay. I, uh, I, I, I'm looking for no problem. Yeah. I'm looking for justification if there is indeed any justification or why uh, why I should be supporting this given the massive departure from the targets. If it was close by I'd be uh, less uh, unhappy, and you know, a point that I've made, and not it's not just about this particular planning application. Most of you here will have heard me say it more than once about oh, carbon offsetting, even at its current ninety-five pound a ton. Um, it's basically, if you can afford to pollute, you can get away with it, and I don't agree with that. Yes, as I obviously as set out in the report and as um, as um, indicated by by the councillor, clearly the residential element is calculated to reduce CO two emissions by seventy one percent. This is compared to the twenty twenty one building regulations baseline, whereas obviously the commercial building is expected to reduce emissions by seventeen percent. Now, the non residential element clearly falls below the thirty five percent. However, um, as officers, not only ourselves, but obviously officers at the GLA have questioned this and, um, and we feel that, that we can't push this any further. At the, at the moment, that the building in terms of energy it, it is, um, it is all green in terms of air source heat pumps. We've got PVs on the uh, photovoltaic uh, panels on the roof. We've got bl uh, blue and green roofs. But clearly, given it's a commercial building and requirements of a commercial building, also there's um, uh, life science facilities within this building. Clearly, that is going to push um, those CO, CO2 emissions. 
So overall, we've taken, we've looked across the, the whole development and we, we, we feel that 29%, notwithstanding it clearly doesn't meet 35%, is, is, still, is still close to that target. And on that basis, um, given um, we have carbon offset payment included, and also we have a condition in the recommendation that the uh, that revised energy strategy will be required to be submitted for consideration. Um, we are hopeful that 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 figure can come down. Not saying necessarily we will hit the thirty five percent, but I think we can get close to it. Thank you. I'm not going. Don't don't want. I've I've made the point. I think reasonably clearly. Just, just hang, hang hang on a sec. Um, but what I will say about this is that. This building is a new build. It's not a uh, refurbishment of an existing building. You know, we can quote, and I think other people will have quoted, the um, town hall development and the work that's being done on making that as green as possible. And that's a, a listed building and not a new one by any means. This is a brand new build, and I would have expected a greater movement towards the uh, target of carbon emissions. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harcourt. Is it on this point? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Carmel. Yeah, yeah. I note that officers have conflated uh, the two buildings. And whilst the, uh, the residential element is 71%, they've conflated the two to come up with a, uh, a figure that is still less than the 35. The actual figure in 12.26, um, on whatever page we care to uh, call it, is less than 50% on a new build. And quite frankly, that is not good enough. It's 17% out of 34, uh, where 35 is the target. Uh, that's, you know, whatever, whatever use the building is, it could be a methane generator or whatever. 17% on a brand new build, on a brownfield site, um, quite frankly, for a, an administration and a council that seeks to be the greenest council in the UK, 17% is not acceptable. Thank you, Councillor Carmel. And I, yeah, I'd like to come in on this as well. So there's mention of the 35%, which is the GLA target, but of course, as a council, we have a net zero target. So that, that would be 100%. And passive house, I think, is around 80%. So my question is, why is it so far below our own standard and, and as you mentioned also below the GLA standard target I should say and can anything be done to improve this at this stage can the applicant give any indication as to any further undertakings that will be taken can officers provide any additional information can anything else be done Councillor Carmel you want to come here in here yeah well, obviously, clearly, we, we we have interrogated this, uh, and we have gone back to the applicant. Um, we we feel that we 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 push this as far as we can in terms of in terms of how in, in terms of sustainability of the building, in terms of provision of, of 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 green energy within the building itself, in terms of the use of air source heat pumps and and PVs. Obviously, the nature of the design of the building obviously clearly limits the amount of, of roof space compared to, to the base of the building. So there's obviously limited amount of, 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 of um, additional green um, energy that could be provided. So overall, we do feel uh, that we, we've taken this as far as we can. Okay, thank you. Yep, Andrew? Um, we've worked incredibly hard on the designs and... We, we do meet the GLA target with the carbon tax to achieve the 35% reduction. We bear, we do understand that that the LBH shaft has increased their carbon target substantially to zero. The calculation, as we understand it, would be a one and a half million payment to achieve net zero. And to support that in the class leading drive from, from Hammersmith and Fulham, we would pledge that sum to the Hammersmith and Fulham. Okay, thank you. So, so just to clarify, a 1.5 million payment to offset the, the... The deficit. The deficit. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Sorry, Chair, is that on top, is that on top of the 343,000 or yes. inclusive of? It's on top of.
Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions? Yes, yeah, Councillor Harvey. Okay, so I've got several questions um, on my bits of paper. Um, I, one of one of the things I'd like to just ask about is the toilets, um, because I've had numerous emails and I've also got all the objections in front of me. So I just wanted to uh, get clarity. Are there going to be toilets in the market or there's not? And if not, why not? That's my first question. Um, yes, there are toilets uh, for public use and for the traders within within the development. They're in, within the ground floor for, uh, of the commercial building. And will they have accessibility for people that need it? Yes, yes, they will. Um, uh, so they'll all be fully accessible. Uh, I just need to check that. Um, let me. Uh, yes, um, there are eight new toilets, um, showers, washing space, kitchens, and uh, uh, kitchenettes for traders. Um, sorry, seventeen. So there are seventeen new toilets for public changing spaces and wheelchair accessible toilets, um, and uh, eight of the new toilets include showers and and washing spaces. Uh, my next question um, relates to the parking in the G-Zone. G -Zone. Um, could you clarify what parking is going to be available? Uh, development is a, is, is a car free. Um, there are There is provision for um, free uh, on-site uh, parking spaces um, for wheelchair users, one dedicated to the residential development and two dedicated to the commercial building. Do, do you think that's sufficient? Because um, looking at some of the objections and the information I've read, um, I can see that there's real concern that actually for visitors and for people that will be living there, that really doesn't seem like quite enough. So how have you come to that figure? Well, we we think it, the figure is actually compliant with the London Plan policies. Policy T six one re refers to uh, residential parking providing up to three percent of the dwellings and at least one designated disabled persons bay being uh, available from the outset. Um, and also in terms of the office parking. Um, the, there's a, there's a provision for for two parking uh, wheelchairs basis thank you my next question relates to comments about the canopies um that they're actually look quite ugly can i just understand why are there canopies um the the comments were also in relation to your turning an outdoor market into an almost indoor market because of all the covering so why are why are, why are you doing that and why are they designed the way they are to address those points about them looking quite ugly. Well, the proposal is for there to be uniformity through the market in terms of one single design across the, uh, across the arches. Um, at the moment, um, there are issues with the current canopy structures in terms of, of um, some of them leaking and obviously um, state of repair. Um, so the idea is obviously not only will they be protecting the existing traders within the stalls and the general public, but they will also be protecting the facades of the arches themselves. Can I ask you what input have the people that live around there and the traders had in terms of helping to design 
those canopies to make them look more attractive? Um, my understanding is that there has been input from the market traders within the, in terms of the, the overall design of the, the canopy structure. And Alan, is there anything you'd like to add? I mean, I think the the the, the key detail of these arches and obviously the canopies that have been through you know numerous iterations throughout the pre-app discussions. I think regardless of whatever approach you take to this, some people will either like it or dislike it. It's a very subjective view in terms of what these canopies become. And I think what we've got is a solution that's quite lightweight in terms of the the detail of providing screening and some shelter from the weather, but also in terms of allowing the particularly the railway viaduct arches and those features of the brick to to still be legible behind that really. So it's a you know again a balanced view in terms of some people will dislike whatever comes forward as a canopy. Some people may like it more than others, but again it's still allowing the the heritage of the market to still be clearly legible behind that that element of the canopy really. Is there any scope for people who are not happy with it to be able to feed in around any future design or is it finalised? Um, in terms of in terms of obviously we got we have we have do have conditions relating to the final designs of the stalls and and the signage, but we we don't have anything with regard to the canopy structure. Um, as as um, Alan's pointed out, we we felt that that the design is appropriate in terms that it is it is lightweight in appearance. We think it's robust and it has it has um, sort of minimal impact on on the actual um, arches themselves. Thank you. Can I just go back to the toilets? Sorry, because I forgot to ask, with the toilets that you've referred to, will there be um, sufficient space for baby changing facilities as well as nursing mothers who may need to use that space to nurse their children? Yes, within the committee report, we've identified as uh, seventeen new toilets, and of those, and um, which are for public use, and they do include changing spaces, and and there are wheelchair accessible toilets. I'm sorry, I don't have the specific number in terms of the wheelchair units. Uh, sorry, wheelchair accessible toilets, um, but overall, there are seventeen new toilets included, and baby changing facilities are included within that. Yes. Okay, so moving on to my next question. Um, one of the things that really concern me is, um, and we've heard about it from Ms. Sims tonight, is the gentrification of the market. So I just wondered, um, th there was talk about potentially bigger firms moving in later on down the road. So how, how are you going to ensure that the market maintains its character, maintains the diversity that it currently has and that we don't lose that because that's very important culturally in our borough. Um, through the chair, we've got the um, obligations within the draft heads of terms in the committee report regarding the legacy traders, which are obviously the core elements of the um, market at the moment and the the um, obligation around there that the that a certain percentage in stages will be signed up um a significant number before any work start and then subsequent stages to to secure um effectively 90 percent of the legacy traders so they do continue to be part of the market um there's a obligation also around a market academy that would be set up which would again um, have objectives around um encouraging training facilitating attracting startups you know independent traders and so forth we will continue to discuss as part of the 106 and indeed the condition around store designs around comfort around the size of this store so that they are and there's an appropriate number of, um, if you like, smaller stores 
to to accommodate and be more affordable for new traders coming into the market and um, it's it, with the current legacy traders a number of them obviously traded up and uh, and have um, merged into other stores and have, are fairly large so they're effectively going to be captured within their own individual negotiations with you capital and their with the assistance no doubt of their own solicitors and securing um terms of their that suit them within their own individual uh, leases but in terms of new traders then we're certainly seek to to do what we can in terms of ensuring within the market designs there's an appropriate number of smaller stores in addition to the academy and the uh, the other uh, obligation um, around, I think there's a contribution, John, within there, you're closer to the detail. Yeah, so the Academy is looking to provide free, tra uh, free training for traders. So it's a hundred thousand per per year operational cost until, and uh, for a period of five years. Can I ask you when does the period of five years begin? Is that presumably at the when, when the development would be completed? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so there's a period of there's approximately a period of three years, which is the the estimated uh, construction program. And then there's a period of five years uh, that kicks in after that. Can I ask you, in terms of, you just made me consider, you know, design of um, the market stores, et cetera, will they be wheelchair accessible? Because I think what we see is a lot of people can't access shops or markets when they've got restricted mobility. So will it be accessible in that way? Yeah, that's obviously one of the issues with the market at the moment, that there are accessibility issues. Um, there are a number of changes in levels and steps into, into some of the shops and, and arches. So obviously one of the proposals is try is to to seek to, to make it accessible for all. Um obviously there there are required minimum requirement distances between the arches and the stalls themselves. I think there's a minimum distance of three meters set to allow safe access on either side of the stalls so uh, overall we feel that the, the market will be more more accessible than it currently is at the moment a lot of questions to ask um so just also looking at more of the objections um there's a real concern that market workers will lose their livelihoods. So how how is that being addressed within this strategy of, of moving forward, like to ensure that people aren't losing their livelihoods, whether they they work on market stores or own them themselves? Um, through the chair, I think sort of Matt's outside, outlined the kind of various sort of safety nets in place. I mean, it's an important part of the policy that you try and improve the market while giving people who currently work there the opportunity to remain. Now, obviously, we've talked about the legacy traders. Sorry, I your, your mic, if you could just thank you. We've talked about the legacy traders, which is the 67, and, you know, we mentioned the 90% of them have signed on to the heads of terms with a view to going forward and completing. The, the, the matters that Matt referred to there about a variety of size of the stores, for example, I mean, obviously, there's a need to replace the ones who are already there have got a bigger requirement but generally speaking i think it's fair to say that they um they are looking to get a variety of sizes in there they've got the they've got the academy in place to try and keep the pipeline of the smaller ones you've got the temporary traders who have an opportunity to sort of learn what it might be like to sell on smaller premises within the market without stumping up for the full 10-year license or whatever so there are various sort of moving parts that are all sort of trying to combine to give that level of comfort and security, if you like. I mean, it's not, a, you know, it's not a given. It's not a black and white situation. You've just got to enable, put the put the measures in place that enable them to stay if they want to. You can't stop people moving if they, if they want to move. 
So it's the, the attention has been all about, you know, what can be done to try and encourage them to stay and uh, make it as easy as possible for them to stay within within reason. I think the answer, to, in short, to your question is, is it's a number of those things overlapping rather than one individual thing, although there are measures here to, you know, periods of grace, for example, no, no business rates and financial payments for those who want to take a sabbatical during the construction process or matters like that. But in terms of moving forward, it's, it's more about the need to have a kind of overview, a strategy, if you like, and, you know, have a, a, a if you like, one of a better term, a selection process in how you identify potential future trainers, changes, how you give them the support, how you give them an opportunity to try their, their themselves out on a smaller level and therefore make it more likely that they, they get success and decide they would want to. For a, for a new lease so there are a number of those measures in there which you know as I say on one end of the spectrum the financial payments and the freezes on on rents and sort of business rates etc and the um, the other end being the, the softer elements the business support the ability to sort of work from a small stall within the market just to test it and see whether you like it so it's it's a combination of all those factors really Councillor Harvey, actually, before you move on, I just want to come in on that. So I'm interested specifically in the uh, support that will be available during the construction. So you mentioned some of the sort of over, over, overriding wider support during the construction, which I think you estimate will take two years. It's it's roughly three years. Three years. So if you could just clarify the financial support that will be available either through grants or through payment holidays. And if the construction takes longer than three years, you know, is this an open-ended package of support or will it end at a certain point? Um, well, obviously during that, those three years, um, the, um, the traders won't, won't be uh, paying any, any rents uh, on, on their, on their, on their own um, stalls or, or shops. Um, and obviously, as as uh, my colleagues pointed out, that there, there's the option, obviously, to to stay or to, or to take a sabbatical if you want. So there is obviously financial um, um, and uh, support if obviously some of the traders want to take a break. Obviously, whilst the construction works are in progress. Yeah, go ahead. Do you, want, do you want to use the other one just so it's it's properly ah, recorded? Okay, sorry, got it? me okay. being done. Um, if it helps, committee, paragraph 8.28 in the committee report lists a lot of the measures there. So obviously we could read through those, but it's it's just in you know, just to be sure that the committee are aware of the of this it's fairly detailed, I guess, is my point. And they are listed there in paragraph eight point two eight and and that is there not just to protect during the construction, but also post construction as well when the market's open. And then there's the 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 continuation of the current protection around service charges, for example. That cap will continue for the existing traders. Um the the new traders coming in, we mentioned earlier about seeking to, you know, agree. Um, sizes of stores and stuff through the design condition um, and the academy. There's also the the affordable, there is a percentage of affordable market retail space that's also being secured, which is detailed in the committee report and the heads of terms section towards the end, which is no less than 10% of retail floor space will be secured at a discount of 10% of the open market for a 10-year period. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, can I just come back to a point that was just mentioned about the sabbatical? Um, so if current market trader takes a sabbatical for the three years, what support would they have to then come back? Because presumably they would have no goods anymore. Maybe they're, they're out of date or they've got rid of them or I don't know. Um, how, how would they be held back? Because... One of the objections actually does talk about market tenants will probably not return after the lengthy building work. So what support would they have to encourage them to come back, if at all? Uh, 
I think that the fundamental issue is that it starts off with the choice. I mean, there are some traders who need to move during the construction because of where they're located currently. And they have the option of taking a sabbatical or being relocated temporarily somewhere else and trading. Um, obviously, one end of the spectrum as well is, is that people might choose to cash in on the kind of premiums for their for their. Uh, premises and and you know those who may have decided that they're at the, the sort of retirement end of the business might take that as an opportunity to go as well so that there's the choice elements there in terms of those who want to stay um you know and and people who can take the sabbatical even if they're not in the areas where they need to sort of move anyway i mean if you if you want to stay you need to be in an area where you know you can or, or be re relocated I guess the issues with, with them then is, you know, what happens with the options at that point? If they decide that they want to surrender the lease, for example, there are measures in place there so that they can run down the stock in and be able to do that. So that they've taken measures to try and support each of the three options, the main three options, i.e. that you, you, you take a sabbatical and then you come back with a new lease. Uh, you remain true trading while the construction is going on, assuming you can, or you get relocated from where you can't and still remain on the site during construction. That's the second one. And the third one is the obviously the other, end, the other extreme where you, you surrender the lease. So if you do take a sabbatical, for example, and you decide to come back, then you know, you'll be offered the lease on the new terms. In the meantime, obviously you'll benefit from the financial um, elements of the most of the traders they will get anyway, which is the sort of cap on the service charge, the the same rental levels, and those who are coming back to um you know to new stalls obviously have the benefit of that. Those who have got their old stalls, they've got the the payments as well that they can look into there. So it's a it's a mix and match, but the vehicle for delivering it is these these heads of terms and how you move them forward into the individual leases for the individual traders who all have different kind of balances of the arguments, I guess. But the, me the measures are there. I mean, the, the critical one, obviously, is the um, is, is the open market review. But that's further down the line. That that, that five years, that five years is post-construction. Um, and the implication is if construction hasn't finished at the end of three years, then, you know, it hasn't finished. So, But the idea is that there will be five years post-construction. Which will cut, which will, which will benefit from those measures as well in terms of the caps, etc. And then you're in, then you get to the, the sort of um, open market review, which is on that on the fifth year post completion of construction. So sorry to interrupt, Councillor Harvey. Um, I just want to be very clear about the wording here, because let's say in the event that this application is approved, the applicant will have three years within which to begin work. So if they if we if the application is approved. And then there's a three-year gap before construction starts. And then there's another three years. Does that mean that the financial support will only be available in the three years that construction occurs or the entire time within which the, the market is closed or disrupted in some way? So is it just the period within which like spades are in the ground or is it is it the whole, whole yeah, time? It's intended to be due for construction during construction process. I mean, I don't know that it's ever... I don't know that I know there's a target for three years in terms of the phasing. I'm not sure whether that is going to be delivered, but the, for the duration of the construction is when they're going to have to sort of relocate some of the stalls from people who are in that in the area elsewhere or, or take the sabbatical. And the five year period, it seems to me, must start from the completion of the construction. It wouldn't make much sense to do it before the construction's finished. I think that the three year that John was referring to is probably coming from the phasing, which is the target dates for the various phases at the moment. So, so I take your point that there, there'll be no need really to pay financial support if the market is still open and, and functioning and there's no construction going on. Um, no, the, the current arrangements are intended to sort of uh, compensate and, and give cho choices to those who, who wish to remain or, or wish to take a sabbatical or, or wish to spend their leases, you know, during that construction period. They're still able to do that afterwards as well. But the construction period is the bit where some people will have to move. And others might take the view that it's going to be too disruptive for them to, to be able to trade properly. So they're, they're the kind of alternative scenarios that they can buy into. 
in terms of negotiating the heads of terms and then following those through with the leases. And each one's going to be different. There'll be some people who are quite happy to remain, I'm sure, you know, people in the arches, for example, who may be far enough away from the development not to sort of think about kind of either surrendering leases or leaving. Some might want to take us back. Well, I don't know, but they, they'll have a choice. They won't be they won't be forced. The only ones who will be forced to move temporarily are the ones who are actually in the areas that they need to use for the building purposes. Okay, thank you. John, did you want to add anything? Again, it's just um, obviously obviously the longer longer the um, you know it's the development is delayed. Obviously, clearly that's going to be more costs to to the developer. So um, I'm not suggesting that they 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 will sit it out for three years, but uh, clearly that you know the longer they they take to commence the development, clearly that's going to be a cost implication to them. Yeah. Would add through the chair that uh, the whole. Um, rationale behind the, the the draft heads 106 is is you know the ones related to the traders is, is, is to protect them so um i think it's it's fairly safe to say that the 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 detailed draft in the 106 will be that that support identified is for a period of three years because that's the estimated time for the construction um or longer if the disruption continues beyond that that period for any for any reason so that would certainly come down to the, the detailed words in, in drafts of the 106, but that certainly would be the, the starting position for um, for officers and the detailed wording to ensure that they are adequately protected. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harvey. Yeah, um, I just want to go back to a comment that you made about the free options. So I was wondering, um, and just going back to the concerns about gentrification, do you have any predictions on how many market traders are going to go through one of those three options? I mean, the short answer is no. I mean, they are heads of terms that have been agreed between the traders and the um, and the owners of the market, and they will be then manifested in the more detailed sort of elements of the leases as they move forward. I mean, all we can be clear about at the moment is is that is that the each of the traders has been offered one of those three alternatives, and obviously they're not binding; they can change their mind. But those are the three alternatives that are that are there, and that is intended to um to commence the discussion on a more on a more individual basis. And you know, there have been a number of meetings between the individual traders and and the capital, for example, in order to do that. And you know, as Matt was saying there before, you can actually start the actual. Uh, market works. You have to com you have to uh, converted a number of those heads of terms agreements into actual, you know, more, more sort of legal positions. So, I think it's fair to say that it's the new capital's interest to move forward as quickly as they can with that process, in the event that they do get a, a resolution. Because failing to do that will mean they can't start the construction works on the market anyway. But okay. To, to answer your question, we don't know about the breakdown. I mean, it, it may be something that the capital have got information on, but that, that's more of a landlord tenants thing. We don't know. We know the numbers, but we don't know, you know, what the what the choices are. And indeed, as I said, those choices can be can be changed anyway. I'll leave it to Councillor Harvey if she wants to ask the applicant any questions. But but go ahead if not. Do you have any further questions? No? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, maybe I have one more just around the highways and the increase in traffic on Gold Hawk Road, Uxbridge Road, and Shepherd's Bush Green. And how's that going to be managed? Um, based, um, through you, Chair. Based on the transport assessment that was submitted with the application, um, there is not going to be a significant increase in traffic. Um, that, that's because it's a car-free development and there's only three disabled parking spaces. So the only, the, the only traffic that's going to be generated by the development is going to be associated with delivering servicing. So we're not anticipating when compared to the, the existing site that there would be an increase in traffic. Can I ask you why is there only three um, blue badge places? That is as 
as was mentioned previously, that's based on London plan um, um, parking standards, and and that's and the three percent comes from um, research undertaken by the GLA on acquisition of blue badge um, holders, or you know people who have applied for a blue badge across London, and um, that's where the trend that is less than three percent, which is where the three percent comes from. Um, in Hampshire and Fulham, all blue badge holders can park for free in a a parking bay in surrounding the site. So they, if there was a someone who was a blue badge holder, they they would also benefit from parking within the borough for free. Okay, Councillor Harvey. No? Okay. And actually, just while we're on the point of transport, I, I note that on page 264, and this is in the addendum, £250,000 financial contribution towards station improvement works at Shepherd's Bush Overground Station. And I just wonder why is that not Shepherd's Bush Market Station, which is obviously closer to the market? And why is it Shepherd's Bush Overground Station, which is quite far away? Uh, that, that contribution was sought by TfL. Um, it wasn't sought by um harbors and transport within Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, that was based on an assessment of um increased passengers at the, the three nearest stations and the impact of um the uplift in passengers associated with um the, the development, which includes the uplift in footfall associated with the market. And based on that assessment, um, TfL came to conclusion that um, there may be requirement for an additional gate line, um, so that's what they've asked for the contribution to. Okay. Um, yeah, Councillor Harvey, do you have another question? Yeah, sorry. It's, um, this one's about sunlight and daylight. So I'm just looking at the objections, um, and within them it talks about no count of housing on the opposite the west side of Lime Grove. Um, and the impact on sunlight and daylight to that. So can I just have some explanation about, has there been no um, consideration? We'll take no account of that. Is that correct? Can you clarify? Sorry, just to clarify, you're asking why there hasn't been sunlight review to dwellings on the uh, west side of the development? Is that, is that correct? Yeah. So at page 102 of the report, one of the bullet points talks about the sunlight and daylight assessment takes no account of housing on the opposite west side of Lime Grove. So I think that's an objection from, from a resident. So I just wanted clarity. Was no account taken of the west side? And if so, why? Okay, so um, in reference to the BRE mythology, the um, the relevant windows to assess are those that are facing within 90 degrees of south. So the way those windows are facing does not fall within that criteria, except for numbers 12, 13 and 14, um, Gormont's Road, and those have been assessed. So the properties that are applicable for assessment is the all the Pennard Road properties, um, Pennard Mansions, uh, because it does have some windows in that uh, west-facing um, uh, elevation, um, but not the properties on the other side of the um, railway viaduct, except for, um, I don't know if you can use on the cursor there, in fact, there's a there's another slide actually. If you, if you keep going through the keep going. Yep, yeah, next. 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 Yep. Yeah. Except for twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. Um so the reason why those windows are applicable is that when you look on plan, those properties are just very slightly angled. And so the rear elevations do actually come into catchment of that um, 90 degrees of south. So do we know if there is an impact on the other properties or do we not take that into account? 
Um, it, you, you would not, there is not a requirement to assess um, sunlight to windows that are not effect, um, not facing within 90 degrees of south because obviously we're in the northern hemisphere and so there's an, there's an expectation that already they would have fairly minimal sunlight provision. So the, the BRE's mythology does not require review where they would not have any sort of meaningful, meaningful sunlight to start with, as it were. Sorry, if I could also add, obviously, in terms of the general assessment, you look at the properties that are immediately adjoining the site. Notwithstanding that, the, the, the assessment has included properties on, on, on opposite sides. So in, in, in paragraph 9.21, we identify that properties 4 to 16 Pennard Road and numbers 10 to 16 even Lanark Mansions in Pennard Road have also been considered. And the same situation has been to some of the properties on the opposite side in Goldwalk Road as well. Sorry, can I just add that the properties that I mentioned are the ones that do have some uh, reductions that don't necessarily meet BRE targets. So beyond those, there were a number of other properties considered, which um, the case officer has just mentioned. Final question from me, <laughs> sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask about the plan around managing people with the offices and the demand, the increased numbers of people and the impact that would have on the residents. Are there any particular plans around managing people coming and going, the noise, there's a lot of information, complaints and concerns about the noise that's going to increase. What are the management plans around that? Yes, within. If any, sorry. Yes, obviously within the um, within the the recommendation, and obviously my my colleague, Highways colleague, um, has pointed out the issue, uh, the matter concerning delivery and servicing. Um, officers have recommended that a, a site management plan be included as part of the section one hundred and six, and will deal with the sort of day to day management of the site. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, a question on design, which we touched on earlier, just to be sure, were all the usual engagements carried out? All the usual design consultation, all the usual engagements, so it was all done as normal? Sorry, just, just to clarify, the, the, the scheme has been subject to design review through the, the pre-app process, so that's clearly um, indicated within the report, the outcomes of that review, and the panel um, kind of questions and clarifications in terms of the quality overall. So, so I appreciate that's the design review panel well, with regards to local residents, traders, you know, were there, was all the usual engagement sort of conducted? Um, yes, that was obviously part of the the, the, the community engagement that um, that is referred to at the start of section four of the report that the, the applicant undertook. So the, there was a series of... Um, consultation events that were held by the applicant um, obviously clearly once the application was submitted obviously clearly then you know we're obviously at the statutory point where where obviously the um the the council invites um local residents to make comments on the application okay thank you um and now again for the benefit of the committee if you could define london affordable rent how is it different from social rent is there a commonly agreed definition? Is it the sort of thing where one council defines it one way, the mayor of London defines it another way, the government defines it another way? If you could provide some clarity on that. Um, obviously, I think uh, um, London affordable rent is obviously set at sort of the cap levels that are set by, by the GLA. Um, so effectively it, it is similar to calling it social rent they are affected they are properties that are are available for for rent so they are complete they are very different to sort of the intermediate uh, shared ownership units that have been identified and when you say it's similar to social rent so are these uh private rent units that are capped or are they uh are the other landlords housing associations for example 
Yeah, there's uh, the typical examples where uh, uh, a registered provider would 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 have uh, cap uh, cap rent levels that we we would normally um, seek to cap within the section one hundred and six, um, and it's all, um, it's normally based around sort of the sort of salary caps um, that the 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 um, the GLA London plan sets. Okay, and I appreciate this is something that we we might not be able to consider at this stage, but is there any indication as to who the landlord will be? Well, the 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 resident the um the forty residential units are are going to be um uh, for for the council. Okay, thank you. Um, now I'd like to come on to the issue of the arches, which was raised slightly earlier. So this is a question to the officers, but I'd also like to address the question to the applicant as well. Um, so we've got the ten thousand pound figure to support the renovation of the arches but obviously there was mention made of some something closer to eighty thousand. so what independent assessment has been done here either, either by the council or by the applicant to to get to that ten thousand figure and if if um the costs overrun is there a commitment to provide further financial support because that's quite a big discrepancy eighty thousand and ten thousand. so i'd just like some more information on that if the officers would like to go first, and then if the applicant has anything to say. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, the, the, the 10,000 is, is is applicable across the board to those who qualify, right? those who aren't getting the new unit. It's, so it's not just the arches. And it's a form of um, of credit to the, 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 that can be used by the individual tenants to upgrade their premises as they see fit. So there's a choice element in there. So my understanding is that um, that, that could cover off certain, in the event that the tenant wants to deal with some, let's say, water ingress, but there are means of dealing with that within the 10,000 cap. It all depends on the nature of the problem, of course, and the nature of the, the problem is going to vary from arch to arch. My understanding of the situation is that the some of the arches have got structures attached to them that the tenants have put up and some of the water leakage is coming from those. So obviously they're outside of the kind of TFL realm, which is the, the structural integrity of the arch, given it's their, their railway asset. So I couldn't I couldn't comment on, on the actual figures. I had a conversation earlier today and, and seemingly there's been some work done about some... Um, Work up, work around, should we say, for, for for water ingress into the arches, which is more of a, a sort of drainage issue, I think. And and the information I was given was that you know that can be done for under ten grand. So if a tenant wants to do that and use the ten thousand credits for it, then that that could be done. I don't know the extent to which you know that figure then would would cover all. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming there will be scenarios where. The nature of the problem, if you like, is such that it wouldn't be covered. And I know that in those circumstances, that well, those certainly those that have been identified so far, there are discussions ongoing with tenants and uh, the new capital. Thank you. Uh, where from? If you just bring the actual thing closer to you as close as possible, that'd be great. Thank you. I don't know if people normally tell me to speak up, I'll be honest. It's normally the way around. But... Okay. So uh, is there anything else you wanted to add? No, I, I think that um, if members want to ask your capital direct, they can, they can probably give some more information on that. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those areas, I guess, where we're straying into landlord tenant stuff as well, because it's more to do with the leases and the nature of the leases and what, you know, what restrictions are on them. But we've we've had to, we've been obliged to look into some of those because some of the issues there overlap with some of the planning issues that we feel we need to look at as part and parcel of the application of the site specific policy here, which is to try and enable improvements and then allow those traders who want to remain to remain. So um, we have done various surveys in terms of the arches. There's forty four individual arches and half arches. There's 28 legacy lease leases in those. There's 26 legacy traders in there. Of that 26, there's about 16 that have a few minor issues and we're dealing with those. 
Um, some of them are actually in the adjoining properties that they're built in from the arches. But what we propose to do with most of the traders is offer them a water, um, basically a water protection system, basically it's a liner to the internal side of the, um, the arch. It's a polycarbonate and what it does is actually just catch the water, it drains to the side and goes into the drainage, the common drainage. So you don't waterproof it per se, you actually allow for the water to go around the arch and then go on through the drainage. And what we've established is £10,000 can do that. We've allowed that we're also talking with the traders to do limited interventions to actually put that in, in because at the moment the biggest issue is because they're trading in there and how we actually get that in. But we think for limited amounts for a basic system, we can get that in and they could then improve their fit outs themselves in terms of the overall cost effectiveness of it. But some of those arches are still quite dry and some of them don't need that that dry lining system, and they will then be able to use that £10,000 for other improvements in terms of um, electrics and things like that that they could do. We've actually talked to the local authority about whether or not there's a grant available for electrics and upgrading of those, and we would actually look to get a grant available for them to actually improve the electrics at the same right. time we do the actual works to the, to the arch itself. But what we've established is there's not that many, and we actually have taken quite a few arches back through the cylinders, and they're being done actually being prepped at the moment with those sort of um, liners, but they to take the temporary um, to traders when we just move them around in the actual um, construction works. So so just to clarify, the ten, they don't have to use the £10,000 to renovate the arch if they find that there are no issues. So, and, and is the £10,000 being offered just to those 16 arches that have problems? No, ev everybody gets the £10,000. So what we want to try and do is look at the, the because we've done surveys, they've not been too intrusive, but the surveys we have done has sort of said the limited um, aspect of the of the leaks. But what we encourage the, um, the, the tenants to do is to put the membrane system in, and that would be warranted for sort of five years in terms of looking at that system. And so that would be something that we would encourage them to do. And if we got our contractors to do it, they benefit from the actual cost effectiveness of the contractor doing it rather than somebody that is going to bring in themselves. And that gives us a standard approach and allows the 10,000 to cover the membrane. OK, and I will come to you, Jake, but but do you have any idea what the 80,000 figure is and, and, and is that... That would be for yeah. a full fit out with a new installation of a mezzanine floor. I mean, some of these, because of the arches, if you're putting in a mezzanine floor, it has to be self-supporting. So in essence, you are actually building a separate mezzanine floor. And we're actually doing one of those in, in 179. And that's actually just to house more units for the traders while we temporarily relocate. So I know I'm digressing, but we've actually agreed with TFL that we can allow to subdivide the arches. The arches currently at the moment are not allowed to be subdivided. You have to have one, one sort of um, tenant in there. At the moment, we, we've actually got to the final um, statement from TFL that we can subdivide. That allows us to put temporary traders in where we've relocated them. But in future, it would allow us also to put temporary, put new traders in there so they could go from a store, a shop, and then into a half arch rather than a full arch, because some of the half arch, the, the full arch is like 2,000, 3,000 square feet. It's a big unit for a, a jump in that zone. So we feel that that's part of the incubator and the process that we can accommodate. Okay, thank you. I will come to you, Joe. Councillor Harcourt, did you have a, a comment on that? Okay. No, it's not, not actually on that. I'm just going back to um, this question of, <clears throat> for clarity's sake, for this com uh, committee, about what is a London affordable rent versus social rent versus genuinely affordable versus all the other definitions of affordable rent. To my knowledge, best to my knowledge, social rent, a social rent is less than the London affordable rent. That That isn't what was... Uh, said as far as I, I heard or did I mishear that that was my understanding what you said yeah. that's what I took from from what the officers said because uh, I understand yeah. what I heard was that they were the same I uh, yeah I, I I think I sought clarification on that but but to my understanding I don't, I don't know if John you want to you want to just completely clarify that social rent is less than London affordable rent sorry obviously the council has checked that they are very they are similar but um but yes um, obviously, the councillors confirmed that um, London affordable rent is 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 is, is better than the, the social rent. Better, higher. <laughs> Sorry, I mean higher, higher. And uh, but but the council will be the landlord. 
So this is council housing with yeah. London affordable rent. Yes, that's, that's okay. correct. So the council is looking to take all 40 residential units. Okay. Councilor Harcourt, did you No. Sorry, no, no, nothing. I was just clarifying that because I didn't want us to yeah, be yeah. under the wrong impression in on this committee. Yeah, thank you. And was this on this point, Councilor Harcourt? The arches? Um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. You actually asked a question that I'd realised I'd missed off my list and was keen to come back to, so I'm glad you raised it. So I just want to understand the point around um, the 10,000 versus what we've heard about 75,000. So why has somebody else, why has it cost them 75,000? Are you saying they've created a mezzanine and that's why it's cost 75,000? Or is it simply it was in such poor disrepair and the person had to go and get get the equipment to fix it from a separate provider and you can help market traders get a good deal to make it £10,000? What is what is that discrepancy? I really want to be clear on it. I, I think what I'm sort of saying to to for the 10,000, it gives a water pen, water safety guard in terms of the penetration of the water and it's just taken to the side. So it actually protects the inside fit out. But some of these arches are very big. And if you want to actually fully fit out the arch and put a new floor in and a new mezzanine, it will go into the tens of thousands. I don't know where Jake is getting that 70,000 from because, you know, he's, he's talking to other traders. But I think you can spend a lot of money because some of these are three, 4,000 square feet if you take the addition at the back. So, you know, what we're sort of saying is most of them, we're actually allowing the 10,000 to waterproof the arch. There still needs to be work done to the to the rear of the units. And that's something that the traders have to look to themselves. OK, thank you. Yeah, Jake, if, you, if you'd like to just come in on the point about the arches and, and just address the committee, please. Thank you. Yeah, so I think it has been made clear by the fact that the applicant has come back on this point so strongly that this is... A critical planning issue and it is the responsibility of the applicant to address the interior disrepair of the arches which is contrary to what the council officers repeated earlier today to this committee and um, that was made extremely clear in the 26th government inspectors report which was upheld by the court of appeals and it stated very clearly that the arches suffer from water leaks and lack of maintenance over a long period of time has worsened the condition that judgment by the government inspector was built upon several independent reports before 2016, including the Parsons Brick and, Brick and Huff report, um, which I believe was originally in 2011 and then was updated in 2013. Um, and the 2016 Court of Appeals judgment very clearly states that the defects identified in the Parsons Brick and Huff report fall within the owner's responsibility. And that was one of the two crucial reasons why the 2016 Court of Appeals overturned the CPO and stated very clearly that any future redevelopment has to address both the affordability, which was the other crucial point, and the interior disrepair of the arches. Everything we've heard from the applicant has mainly related to the exterior of the arches and protecting drainage issues of the exterior. Uh, the point raised by Andrew just now about um, the contraption within the arches that, that isn't mentioned in the planning officer's report or any of the, the applicants planning documents so this is a, something we've heard today for the very first time there's no there's absolutely zero credibility to suggest that that can address the serious structural disrepair identified in multiple government approved reports um <laughs> just for, off, off the cuff from an off, off the cuff comment today to this committee um and as as mentioned previously and um the Mayor of London also confirmed the point about uh, the applicant being responsible for the intent when they said in 2016, they were asked a question, um, again, something we raised to the planning officers, but wasn't included in the report once, um, which stated very clearly that Orion are responsible for the interior curve of the arches. That's a direct quote. Obviously, that responsibility has now passed the U Capital since they purchased the majority of the um, arch. Um, I also just want to note that the figure of £80,000, which was something that was told to us by, um, by a trader, so I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I 100% have, um, you know, the, I haven't seen the financial documents, but that's what we heard. But just to clarify on that point, that uh, there were still water leakage issues in that arch after the £80,000 was spent, so it's failed to address it. In many of the arches, traders have buckets 
what, because water is leaking through the units constantly, um, there's really horrendous like interior disrepair issues. So I think for the applicant just to state that there are a few minor issues is completely insulting to this committee. Um, and the final the final point I want to make on this point is that this, and again, this was made clear in the 2016 Court of Appeals judgment, if you've read it, um, this whole issue relates very, very closely to issues around affordability and long-term affordability of the market to traders, because if the arch was to collapse or um, a big part of the retail space becomes unusable because of water ingress, which is already the case, that's obviously going to have a big financial impact on the trader um, in terms of the retail space being unusable and also having to fork out from their own pocket to, to fit the, the, the issues when they become more serious. Um, so that's another reason why this isn't planning concern, which it's not just the court ruling and the 2016 mayor's statement, but it's also uh, to do with affordability policies. And sorry, very, very quickly, I just want to quick say on the social and affordable rent, my understanding is that affordable is a 50% discount from open, open market rent, whereas social is an 80% discount of open market rent. So again, it's not a small difference. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Matt. Did you want to come in? Uh, through the chair, the, the head lease with... Um... I guess any three holder, but uh, certainly in terms of Shepherd's Bush Market with TFL, when they have a, obviously an operational um, network running, a railway running over the top, is that the, the, um, any leaseholder won't be able to do any works, the actual structure itself. So um, as we've been informed, the head lease just covers the airspace effectively under the arch and, and the floor area. So any sort of structures that are attached to it would have to act independently um, in terms of um, the inherent nature of arches is, especially these historical ones, is that water will find a way through with all the will in the world, wherever you do, water will find a way through the bricks and the mortar. So that it's a case of uh, directing the water away so it's not falling into the arches. So that was a key concern of ours through the application process in terms of protecting the traders in the arches from water ingress. So the the agreements for lease that we've talked about, which are the documentation referred to in the draft heads around securing X amount being signed up before work start and then subsequent stepping up. So we have a situation where 90% are signed up. That agreement for lease is that there will be a credit, a 10,000 credit for investment, which includes the arch traders, or indeed the, ins the installation of a water protection system. So it would be one or the other, but ultimately, if the 10 grand is insufficient, then we will secure within the permission that the applicant has to provide a water protection system. So we're convinced then that that will ensure that no water is coming in through into the unit. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Councillor Harvey, yeah. Yeah, I just want to come back on one of the comments that was just made. Um, as far as you're aware, is there any risk or danger to the arches collapsing that you're aware of? Uh, through the chair, not that we're aware of. I mean, obviously, something like that would be absolutely major to the, the operation for TFL of their um, underground. So um, I, I would assume I would assume that they are assured that uh, there's no structural risk of that nature. I would assume there's no structural risk. Um, TFL do six monthly inspections of all the arches with us, so there isn't any structural risk. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? No further questions. Okay, I'd like to ask Andrew and Jake to return to their seats, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I've just been advised by legal that uh, with regards to the 1.5 million additional payment that was um, mentioned by the applicant, we will need to amend a condition or propose a new condition on that. 
So I just want to ask if the officers have any final thoughts or, or comments on that. Uh, yeah, through the chair, that would be an additional uh, head of term within the 106, which clearly isn't in the, the current report or the addendum. So yeah, that would need to be a new a new addition. Okay, so um, would anyone like to propose that condition? I'll propose it. And uh, second, seconder. I'll second. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just um, just one moment. Okay, so, so that's on an obligation within the section 106. So we have a proposer and a seconder, and we will vote on that before we vote on the application itself, which we will do now. So um, voting on that obligation of the 1.5 million additional um, included within the section 106. Councillor Harvey, do you vote for or against or not voting? For. Councillor Walsh? For. Councillor Harcourt? For. Councillor Carmel? Can I just... On a point of clarification, what we're doing is we're adding an extra head of term to the section 106, which will be agreed by the officers and the applicants. That's correct. That's my understanding. Well, I've been advised by legal that we do need to vote on it. And how, how will you be voting? In favour? OK, and I also vote in favour. So that obligation has been passed. Now we move on to recommendation one in the report. And I'll just read it out that subject to there being no contrary direction from the mayor of London, that the Director of Planning and Property be authorised to grant planning permission upon the completion of a satisfactory legal agreement and subject to the conditions listed below. Councillor Harvey, will you be voting for, against, or not voting? For. Councillor Walsh? For. Councillor Harcourt? Against. Councillor Campbell? Against. And I'll be voting for. Now we move on to recommendation two. That the Director of Planning and Property, after consultation with the Assistant Director of Legal Services and the Chair of the Planning and Development Control Committee, be authorised to make any minor changes to the proposed heads of terms of the legal agreement or proposed conditions, which may include the variation, addition or deletion of conditions. Any such changes shall be, be within their discretion. Councillor Harvey. Four. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Harcourt. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. And I'll also be voting four, so that application has been approved. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone for attending or watching tonight's meeting. And the minutes of this meeting will be approved at the next uh, planning committee meeting, which will be on January. Thank you very much.